ஆகியவற்றை காரணத்துடன் ஏற்றுக்கொள்ளும் போதுமான மெய்யறியும் புரிதலும் எங்களுக்கு வழங்குக உங்களது வாழ்த்துக்களையும் அருளையும் கருணையும் எல்லா சூழல்களிலும் நேரங்களிலும் அனைத்து மக்களிடையே கொடுத்து அருளுங்கள் தேங்க்யூ தேங்க்யூ டாக்டர் தாட்சாயணி மே நோ ரிக்வஸ்ட் அவர் பிரசிடென்ட் சுரேபாலன் சார் டு சே அ ஃபியூ வேர்ட்ஸ் அண்ட் ஃபெலிசிட்டேட் தி ப்ரோக்ராம் வெரி குட் ஈவினிங் டு ஆல் ரெஸ்பெக்டட் செக்ரட்டரி டாக்டர் திருமுருகன் ட்ரெஷரர் டாக்டர் தாட்சாயணி and the chairperson for uh, today's program dr aram sandil all the uh, eminent personalities who have joined today uh, dr uh, mona baskar dr vijay rani dr akila ayyavu dr nityananda and dr geeta patil madam uh, dynamic past secretary dr rajendra academy coordinator dr gobal is the treasurer was uh, treasurer now the joint secretary all the uh, people who have joined online uh, it's a great uh, and a happy moment for each and every one of us on this uh, important uh, celebration day that is international adolescent health care week which is being organized by the indian academy of uh, pediatrics and the aha chapter of chennai coimbatore and kanyakumari so first of all i like to congratulate the adolescent health academy Uh, the central uh, adolescent health academy for uh, giving us the uh, permission to start three district branches chennai coimbatore and kanyakumari and uh, now we are also moving ahead for another two more branches so that we will have a separate uh, state chapter for adolescent health academy so i uh, extend my uh, great thanks to dr geeta patil madam from central aha for taking this great initiative and the state team especially uh, dr uh, vijay rani madam and uh, dr uh, lakshmi santhi dr sendil sir and all the stalwarts from our state who have taken the initiative to start this uh, academy so welcome once again all the office bearers of the various district branches of adolescent health academy and uh, as you all know that uh, this year the theme is uh, with and for adolescents building a healthier and more inclusive future that is the theme for this year and we all know that uh, this uh, adolescent health care awareness week is a grassroots initiative for young people and their health care providers the teachers the parents and the communities to work in liaison or in coordination with one another to understand the various issues which uh, the adolescents are facing and for them to have a better growth and development mentally physiologically psychologically everything aspect of their Uh, life so we know that about 1.2 billion people all around the world are in the adolescent age group and they have unique problems at various levels and uh, this year they are concentrating on one important issue that is on drug abuse how we can meaningfully uh, address it by planning together with adolescents that is one of the important things so there are area specific region specific issues and we all have adolescents at home and our we are all very much uh, uh, facing tough times in managing adolescents especially uh, in our uh, growing this uh, electronic gadget media and so many changes in the developing world of our country we face so many issues so i am very happy to be a part of this program and i congratulate all the office bearers for taking this initiative and especially the eminent speakers for today who have joined online who are going to address on the various issues of adolescents thank you and welcome you all thank you sir um i'm just waiting for dr ismail sir while we wait for dr ismail sir may i now request our academy uh, coordinator uh, dr raizan sir to say a few words yeah good evening to everybody and uh, respected our um, president uh, dr k u suresh balan and uh, dynamic secretary dr thirumurugan and uh, treasurer dr dashani and uh, dr geeta patel madam <coughs> and uh, today's um, uh, and the chairperson uh, dr aram sandil sir and uh, today's uh, speaker dr mona baskar and uh, vijayrani dr ayla yavu and uh, dr nithyananda so other uh, dignitaries um, to attend this program as well as uh, participating uh, as a faculty it's my great pleasure and privilege to be here with the association with you and it's uh, as 
uh, Dr. K. Suresh Balan sir said, <coughs> adolescence actually is a chunk of uh, uh, population. You have to need to concentrate their health issues and uh, specific adolescent issues also. I think I'm so happy that we are having a poem tour as well as uh, Chennai and uh, Kanyakumari, they started that uh, one branch. <coughs> and uh, I think very soon I, under the leadership of Dr. Uh, K. Suresh Balan sir, we'll uh, initiate another two more branch and we can go for a state uh, EAP adolescent IHA chapter uh, and it's my uh, once again I wish and uh, make the program to get success. Thank you very much. Thank you sir. Uh, may I now request uh, the president of adolescent uh, health chapter AHA Chennai Dr. Uh, Sandeep Kumar sir to say a few words. Uh, good evening everyone. On the outset, I thank uh, Dr. Suresh Baran, sir, our president, Dr. Thirumurugan, sir, and uh, our secretary and uh, treasurer, Dr. Dashani, madam, and eminent uh, teachers and eminent senior person, uh, Geeta Patil, madam. And it gives an immense pressure for me uh, to be a chairperson for this uh, academic year, scientific year. And uh, as our president gave an address uh, regarding the different tasks and the different challenges which are being faced by the fraternity in addressing the adolescent issues, which as a family, as a team, we all will join hands with each other and uh, take up this task so that we will be a great tool to change the society and uh, bring uh, good changes and expectations that are being made every year and the agendas that are being made every year that should be implemented through the team and uh, it will be a great success for, and uh, it will give a great uh, honor and a feather to our crowd. Thank you everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Now, uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Geeta Patil, ma'am, uh, National President of IHA chapter, to declare the, uh, to inaugurate the CME. I'm a National President elect. Wanakkam, good evening. I think uh, uh, Dr. Sukanta, sir, is not well. So he cannot talk. On his behalf, I'm here. First, let me congratulate Tamil Nadu IAP and Koimtur Kanyakumari Chennai AHA. As a jointly, they have arranged this program. And let me thank Dr. Senthil, who is the EB of Central IAP as well as AHA. And past president of Tamil Nadu, Dr. Suresh Balan, sir. Present president, Dr. Ramesh Babu, immediate past president. Dr. Balshankar, president-elect. Trun Mugan, secretary, treasurer. Dakshaini and academic coordinator, Dr. Rajendran. I think we all know that this is an international adolescent week, which we are celebrating between 19th of March to 25th March. So the theme of international adolescent week is with and for adolescents building healthier and more inclusive future. What does it mean that engaging adolescent as an equal stakeholders in decision making and agenda setting. So we should recognize adolescent as a ex themselves as a ex experts in defining their well-being. So adolescents have to be with us for each session. Say we talk among each other, we don't know what they want. So, and each day there is a different agenda for International Adolescent Week. And all of us we talk. Investing in adolescent health gives us triple dividend. The adolescent will be healthy next when they become adult, healthy and next generation also. And now we know that adolescent health as there is a 22% population in India is adolescent. So their health, physical, mental health problems are a little different. Tackling with them in the clinic, it is different. Management is also a little bit, it is different. Most of the treatment when we give to a child, it is parent-centered. But now we have to move on to adolescent-centered. So there are transitional care is there, extended adolescent, 
friendly health services are there all these things now has gained momentum among us as well as in the government it's a really a great thing that adolescent healthcare is given prime importance the many government policies are there and as you have selected very appropriate topics heads very important adolescent counseling obesity role of pediatrician in poxo cases and all the esteem faculty dr mona bhaskar dr vijayarani dr ahila and dr Nir, uh, nityanand all of them are experts in this field who will enlighten everyone and give us correct message at the end of the session and this is a great initiative by iap as well as aha mainly aha to celebrate the international adolescent week i declare that inauguration is done for tamil nadu and i want to bring out to notice somebody was telling kanyakumari coimbatore chennai now there are two branches with the 15 members are left out and i wanted to inform aha membership has reached to 2820 i think dr chentil sir knows he was there in the meeting and south zone has got three states kerala has got a aha state branch karnataka is launching tomorrow state branch so why not tamil nadu in just a month's time it can happen if you decide it doesn't take much time only thing you have to motivate people as aha has become a very vibrant and useful chapter of iip increase the membership motivate the people to conduct the thing it will be a great initiative and it will contribute to improve the adolescent physical and mental health disorders thank you very much for giving me opportunity and wish you all the best for this program as well as the coming programs what you are going to arrange and we are going to have a south zone module also uh, i just want to bring it to notice that we are going to have one module from south zone for ah we are not still wor started working on that but we'll start working and then hand over to aha which will be taken as a workshop during adults con in amritsar already registrations are done so it is a great responsibility on our our head to prepare the module dr sentil sir and me we are the coordinators and we are trying to after this international adults and we get so we'll try to start working on that if any help is required from central aha please convey i will convey to sukanta sir and arjun sharma who is a secretary and the problem will be solved as membership problem are there sometime payment problems are there there are certain issues are happening so motivate more and more number lakshmi shanti is there in the membership committee if i am not wrong so is it dr lakshmi yes 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 ma'am yes, ma yes. yes ma so you have to take it forward that day you were asking two branches required and it won't take time only one yes, state in south zone is left out with the state branch so by within two months we can finish it up of that agenda also thank you very much once again wish you all the best and all the faculty i think at the end of the session we are going to learn a lot thank you very much thank you thank you very much ma'am now we now request uh, our uh, the chairperson for the evening dr aram sentil sir uh, past president of uh, iapt nsc and the current central iap eb member uh, and somebody who has taken a lot of interest in adolescent health care to chair the session please over to dr aram sentil sir thank you dr thirumurugan uh, anaivarkum iniya maalai vanakkam uh, today is on behalf of international adolescent health week 2023 iap tnsc and aha chapters of chennai coimbatore and kanyakumari have combined and going to focus on the pediatricians of our state and let them know what is adolescent care and the basics of adolescent care so that's why we selected these topics and we have got four wonderful personalities dr mona baskar dr vijay rani uh, dr ahila yahu and dr nityananda from bangalore 
So this program was just hardly, we thought of it on Monday. And today and Friday, we are launching it by our central AHA chairperson elect, Dr. Geeta Patel. Thank you, madam, for coming over. And uh, uh, this initiative was actually taken by Dr. Pradeep Kumar and Dr. Suresh Balan, our president from uh, uh, Kanyakumari, actually. They wanted to have a meeting. So with their uh, initiative, I talked to Dr. Vijay Rani. She is always uh, a person who can, we can just go to her and ask anything and she will readily oblige. And so initially, she would, so she took the pains in contacting everyone. And now we are here. So over to the first topic. And uh, this topic is adolescent history taking by the HEADS model. So uh, this will be done by the expert from CMC Belur, Dr. Mona Baskar, whom I have been associated with for so many years. And she's been a, a wonderful pillar of support. Uh, she's, she has done a PGDAP from Kerala University. MDDCH from CMC Velo. She is a clinical fellow in adolescent medicine, the Hospital for Sick Children from University of Toronto. She has established the adolescent medicine faculty in CMC Velo. So her areas of interest are primary adolescent health care, adolescent onset eating disorders, adolescent school health education, child and adolescent sexual abuse, institutional child production policy. So let us go to the first topic. Over to Dr. Mona Maska. Over to ma'am. Please unmute. Thank you, Dr. Sandel. I'll try to share a screen now. Yes. Uh, is it visible? You can make it uh, full screen. Is that okay? Uh, now it's okay. You can proceed. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, head screen and how to talk to adolescents. Um, so I have titled this talk as How to Talk to an Adolescent. So what do we need to know about how to talk to an adolescent and why we should talk in a particular way to the adolescent? So all of you may have seen uh, adolescents at various diverse situations, like this group of uh, teenagers who are probably hardworking from a rural uh, setup. You might see adolescents in, uh, very interested in athletics or physically very active and competitive. You may see adolescents with good family support. You might also see adolescents without any family support and struggling with just growing up as a teenager. You would have seen uh, adolescents who are uh, very much into risk-taking behavior. All the people who are here in this picture doesn't mean they are risk-taking uh, adolescents. They might be some who are just watching, just wondering whether they should take any risks in life with regard to, with regard to their health. These seem happy, contented. And this is a group of adolescents who have uh, disability. And so adolescents with disability and other chronic illnesses like uh, diabetes or uh, who are a special group of adolescents within this adolescent age group, for them dealing with a chronic illness complicates their actual uh, problems associated with growing up as, an, as a teenager. So there are some adolescents who at the outset may seem like they're very confident, they know what they're about, but actually they may be having a lot of inner turmoil, inner problems. And you as a healthcare professional might be the only person who can give them correct information, accurate information about how to keep themselves healthy and safe. So whenever we deal with an adolescent, we also come, uh, we always present as not talking down, not being judgmental, but be uh, very open to whatever they say. And also at the same time, keep reassuring them that we are not looking down on them or we are not judging them for their high-risk behavior if they have. But we want to uh, talk to them and deal with them, treat them from the uh, point of keeping them safe, keeping them healthy. With this, I'd like to start uh, my uh, talk about how adolescents differ from adults. Earlier as pediatricians, we used to have um, uh, adult physicians saying that they can manage children because they are like tiny adults. 
similarly, and as pediatricians, we used to look down on such a statement. Similarly, we need to understand that adolescents are not tiny adults. They differ because of a biological reason in the way they behave, the way they solve problems, and make decisions about their own life. And as adults, even though we have gone through this adolescent age group, sometimes or many a time we do not understand why they are impulsive, irrational, dangerous in their uh, life. The reason is this. Uh, so there's a lot of research which has looked at the uh, brain of adolescents. And two important areas to think about are the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. With a lot of uh, functional MRI studies done across the world, and we don't seem to have much from India. What we know now is the limbic system, <clears throat> which is responsible for fear, aggression, impulsive behavior, all that is uh, developed much earlier. Whereas the prefrontal cortex, which is important or necessary for a teenager or an adult, uh, for reasoning, uh, to choose between right and wrong, to modify emotions based on what is acceptable uh, in their ambience in which they are living, uh, is not fully developed. So because of the fact that the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, is a reason why adolescents often have high-risk behavior. So we need to understand as healthcare professionals this and be aware of it, be conscious of it whenever we deal with a teenager. Uh, in a clinic setting or wherever. Some specific changes in the adolescent brain, again, because of this uh, numerous functional MRI studies, show that there is a rapid increase, uh, apart from the early uh, toddler age, increase in the internal pathways. And also, there's some important, uh, interesting fact that is happening in the brain pathways for the ruling. Basically, it means that some areas of the brain which are not stimulated become redundant. And those which are stimulated, those areas of the brain are stimulated, become more uh, active. Myelination increases during this adolescent age, and all these are essential for developing a coordinated thought action behavior. So, this is not, you know, it's in a chaotic stage in the adolescent uh, brain. Amygdala, as you know, helps in discriminating your mother emotions. This is more active among adolescents than the adults. There are studies by uh, this person called Google on Thought, Deborah, uh, looking at adolescent uh, teen, um, how they misread facial expressions. They actually do not see the uh, expression or the facial uh, or the emotion that an adolescent adult feels when they see it uh, when they see an adult. So they misperceive or misunderstand emotions. Instead of fear, they may see sadness or anger or confusion. Try to think of this. So then what happens to the teenager? So they miscommunicate, misunderstand because of that. And so the way they react to an adult and the way they understand what the adult is trying to tell them or communicating to them is all you know, uh, chaotic and they don't really understand this. And that's the reason sometimes they may not respond in the way that we expect them to respond. Prefrontal cortex, as I said, is important for insight, judgment, impulse control, planning, strategizing, all this. And so if you don't have your son, you do it be because of what you are And then, like I said, it's only in the mid 20s Some studies say 23 years among girls, 25 years among boys. But around the mid 20s is when the prefrontal cortex is fully developed. So Excuse me, madam. Excuse me, madam. Dr. Mona, or just a minute. Uh, can you come near the mic? Uh, there is some uh, audio. Uh, can you come near the mic? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, now it is better. Okay. So basically we need to remember this and uh, that doesn't mean that you give an excuse to an adolescent behavior which is high risk behavior. It is just for us to understand as adults why they behave the way they behave and then put in strategies to keep them safe, to keep them healthy. Uh, so teens process information differently from others. Again, the same study. As they grow, they progressively shift the activity, the brain activity shifts from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. Now, what is the implication for us as health professionals in the public health system, in the school setting, generally all adults? So, adolescent education practices also to keep in uh, mind that adolescents, you know, have a biological clock which makes them sleep late, wake up late. Some countries in the West have actually changed the school's timings for adolescents. What does it mean in the juvenile justice system? 
the way a harsh punishment is given to an adolescent uh, to an adult who commits a crime should be different from how we deal with adolescents in the juvenile justice system adolescent health seeking behavior itself should be uh, made easy for them to access health care uh, so that we take into account that adolescents do not understand a lot of things so they need more talking to they need more explanation to be able to comply with whatever we are asking them to comply with towards their treatment what is the implication to the teenager you must you must use this we could use this information and tell the teenager how they have a control over certain things that they do in life and they are smart enough to make choices which are safe and healthy for themselves so then it makes sense to do a lot of activities which are positive uh, as a teenager to do a lot of extra curricular activities to develop different parts of the brain so this is something that we can use when we talk to teenagers when we give them some health education um so that is about the adolescent brain so uh, there is so much of literature for us to go back to read and find out about uh, the implications of adolescent brain development uh, coming to consent consent as you know is a voluntary approval to be examined due to the subject to any test so it must be obtained prior to any examination test or treatment informed consent you all know that you have to teach the teenager what is good or bad or what is safe or unsafe and the various options there are for them to make a informed decision about uh, what they want to do for example in uh, terms of teen pregnancy it's important to talk to them about uh, various options it's called options counseling to teach them about what it means to go through a pregnancy or terminate a pregnancy that's just a simple example but there are so so many other things where you need to talk to teenager to be able to help them understand what treatment they are going through and to be able to comply with the treatment exactly how confidentiality is important for adults patients right to privacy and freedom from public dissemination of information is important for teenagers as well of course there will be some conflict between confidentiality as is defined in the west versus what is defined what is possible for us in india now research in adolescent health believes that one of the most important aspects of medical care is confidentiality who endorses this kind of confidentiality to a certain extent and it is based on mutual trust and as you all know building a rapport with uh, an adolescent as a healthcare professional will result in compliance and good outcome of illness so for that reason it's important to have this confidential or an alone interview with the teenager at least to a certain extent as much as is possible and as much as uh, the teenager and the family is able to uh, agree with you for so <clears throat> in the west personal health information is all confidential except in terms of whenever there is abuse or there is this, whether there is a suicide or there is like a crime going to happen or the teenager talks about homicidal tendencies all of the information is kept confidential for a teenager but in india uh, you know that the law says that only after 18 that they become an adult and then they are a child there is no specific uh, uh, provision for the teenager but in our practice what we see is that it is very flexible so when we talk to teenager and talk to the parent and say that are you okay for having this confidential interview with us so that they are able to talk to us about sensitive issues so we can help them out very often they agree so this is just a bit about the law majority is 18 years consent to empty the donation of organs all that you need to be 18 years anyone less than 12 years is a minor cannot give consent for anything 12 to 18 can give consent for medical examination but not for any procedure but if there is a medical emergency any adult who brings a teenager can give consent um coming to this important uh, like what are the attributes of an adolescent physician or a good adolescent physician or any physician who deals with a teenager what are the things that you need to uh, have first is a genuine interest in adolescent issues if you are interested in adolescent issues you will deal with them in such a way that they see that you are on their side what is what does it mean to be open minded so if a teenager talks about say i just started smoking or i just uh, tried some alcohol or have just been uh, sexually active it is important to um, ask questions in such a way that the adolescent is able to uh, 
uh, give a lot of information about themselves and we are able to help them uh, it is important to be non judgmental it is important to be flexible it's important to all also be respectful towards an adolescent and not treat them as somebody very small and look down on them so obviously good communication skills are important and if we ensure confidentiality to a certain extent explain it up front when they first come to see us then it's easier to deal with a teenager in a hospital setting okay <clears throat> coming to finally heads so heads is basically a psychosocial review it's just like a uh, at the end of a, a pediatric history taking we have review of systems to look at the other systems which may be associated involved it's like that it's a psychosocial review of systems uh when you do a heads uh, uh, assessment uh, it sometimes takes one or two hours if you have to go through all the various components of heads and it's possible it's not possible to address everything in the first visit sometimes it may uh, you may have to do it at the next visit the idea is to make a list of uh, problems with uh, relation to these various components which will impact on their uh, clinical outcome of whatever illness that they are having history as you might know it was started off by henry bergman and then refined by a clinical fellow in uh, los angeles children's hospital and we continue to keep adding uh, uh, to the acronym now what is uh, why is health important because this is a stage when adolescents are exploring they are experimenting with high risk behavior again they have a lot of peer pressure if you go to psychosocial uh, stages of development during middle adolescence they think that the adults don't know anything it's only the friends who know everything so depending on what kind of peer influence whether it is negative or positive they can uh, end up having high risk behavior or not during this stage there is increasing risk taking behavior increasing autonomy from the uh, immediate family which is all normal part of adolescent development so when you do this health assessment to it's to explore each of these areas to see where there is a problem which may affect the clinical outcome of an illness of a uh, normal growth of an of a teenager now as you know it stands for home is education also employment and then eating specifically about eating disorder eating behavior activities peer related activities say like what are the things that they would do as uh, for uh, during leisure activity drugs of course we, we don't use drugs uh, it's a derogatory term it's a negative connotation substance use s is sexual health safety with regard to road safety internet safety <coughs> sorry sexual health safety another s is suicidality and finally s spirituality is also added because there is some literature to say that a spiritual person in either is more resilient and as you can see it's this uh, health uh, psychosocial review looks at less sensitive issues to start with and then more sensitive issues as uh, as you go the typical mo while you're dealing with an uh, adolescent is you do the history with the adolescent and the parent together in the room then ask for permission to see the teenager alone and explain to the family that this privacy is important uh, and then you take on basically to help them understand that the teenager will uh, you know engage with the healthcare professional in a better way if this uh, privacy is given and they can take more responsibility for their own health how do we ask questions uh, we go through these uh, uh, various questions uh, i'll just come to the slides eventually and it should all be open ended questions so that it's not a yes or no answer that they can give and they can explain a situation which are they however comfortable they feel never be judgmental like i said and never or try not to show any surprise or shock when they talk about high risk behavior and always be willing to go an extra mile if it's not just within the clinic uh, you might have to do extra beyond the clinic uh visit so the actual questionnaire is very different i'll show the model towards the end the last slide but what we practice is like kind of what we have adapted for our teenagers like the indian teenagers in our community so when you come to home we are basically asking them what is their relationship with each of the members in the family who do they go to in times of trouble suppose they don't have anybody in the family so that is a red flag for you so are they going elsewhere where they may not be safe so that is the reason we ask all questions about home it's also about do you move from one home to the other a lot and so uh, the group of uh, friends that you deal with uh, spend time with changes a lot education of course we have different uh, streams of education so important to know what is the uh, 
school they are studying in, what stream of education, what subjects they like, and what are their career op uh, options. So as a young teenager, like 11, 12, they may say, I want to become a pilot. A couple of years later, they may change their career option. That doesn't matter. But it's important to ask them that career option and say uh, how they think they, they can move towards that career option. These are uh, basically to look at grades. If they're not doing well in grades, it might be a red flag for intellectual compromise. So may need more assessment to look at uh, whether their IQ is borderline low and whether they need more help to uh, do better in academics. So diet, of course, we, we all know about the unhealthy diet and uh, uh, unhealthy lifestyle. Many of us as adults and adolescents have. So, so it's important to talk about uh, normal uh, diet and what they're used to. Also about what their body uh, image is. Do they look at themselves, whether they are you know, obese or not, whether they look at themselves as uh, comfortable in their weight and so And whether they have done anything high risk in this like following a diet, trying to lose weight. Uh, do they, uh, are they physically active? Are they uh, sleeping enough? How good is their sleep hygiene? Uh, are they spending too much time in front of the screen? So all these are important in this eating behavior, eating and eating related uh, behavior. Activities basically means peer related activities. Why is it important? Because like I said, peers are more important for us at a particular stage. So if they end up with good much of uh, yeah, they may be into a you know, football uh, team or uh, you know, choir or something like that, but they get into dance and get into substance abuse, and that also is a problem. So it's important to talk about it and find out how they spend time with their friends and what they do for, during their time of leisure. Substance of abuse, of course, there are so many different substances and it is not regulated in our country. So any kid can go to any shop and you know buy some uh, you know cigarettes or alcohol for their uh, tata or mama and they uh, and the shopkeeper will give it to them. So it's important to ask this because we want to know uh, how uh, much they are exposed to. And if they actually started using some kind of substance, how how do you help them get out of it? So it's important to ask these questions. And craft questionnaire is basically to teach uh, to tell us whether it is a problem. Uh, substance use. Basically that, is it uh, so bad that they may need you know, admission or more professional help like with a child like that. Um, this is again, uh, talking about sex is a country. So it's important to reassure a teenager when you first see them saying that, you would probably say, uh, this is a question that we ask all teenagers who come to this clinic. It's not meant to, you know, make you uncomfortable or embarrass you. It's basically to keep you healthy and safe. Once you have that opening sentence, then start off by saying, um, uh, do you have any friends who are boyfriends or girlfriends? And then if they talk about that, then you come to themselves and see, have you ever had a boyfriend or girlfriend? If they say yes, and then move again to say, what kind of sexual activity they are into? And if they have been sexually active, of course, you have to talk about STIs, HIV, AIDS, pregnancy, uh, and how to be safe in terms of not just contraception, but also uh, to prevent or keep them safe, safe from intimate partner violence. Because there are some adolescents who do get physically abused, sexually abused, without realizing that they are being abused. Uh, even though the abuser may be you know, you know, just their classmate or a three or four year older than them. So it's important to talk about these things in a very non-threatening way. But it is important to ask this question and not you know, shy away from that question. One of the things as a healthcare professional, I found useful is that uh, you feel comfortable about your own sexuality. Sex is not something that you've invented, it is created, it is there in every person. So say that to the teenager and say, don't worry, you should not be, uh, you know, uncomfortable about the questions that we ask them. The reason why we ask them is to keep them healthy and say, not from a moral uh, viewpoint, or a faith-related uh, viewpoint to look down on them, even if they are sexually active and you know it is high-risk behavior. Suicidality. Very often we hear uh, wrongly people saying that you talk about depression, suicide, the teenager will become depressed. There's enough and more literature to say that that is not true. Uh, so it is important to ask about uh, deliberate self-harm. Basically, do you cut yourself? Do you feel sad most of the time? Is there a reason why you're feeling sad? Have you ever thought of killing yourself? It is not at all. Uh, wrong or 
detrimental to a teenager to ask if they have thought about suicide because if they are thinking about it and you haven't asked there is a teenager who might complete suicide so it is important not to skip this uh, domain in the head space also important to explore with the family whether there is psychiatric illness in the family then again that's a red flag for you safety we often talk about uh, road safety uh, basically helmets and belts do they travel on a foot or on a bus uh, are these cybers are they aware of cyber safety do they know that they cannot uh, give their personal information like you know on social network site and it will uh, they end up in trouble if they give their personal information uh, sexual health safety of course uh, uh, the speaker another speaker will talk about also we do talk about history of whether there is uh, has been abuse in the past uh, using pictures and uh, making it easy for them to talk about it spirituality like i said has been added on to his uh, screen uh, so basically if a teenager believes in a higher uh, being uh, they are excuse me madam one to... minute one minute only yes okay so this is just a, uh, a sample screen the green is essential to ask about uh, for all teenagers if possible it could ask the blue and if there is a problem in any of the domains uh, whether it's in school or whatever then you go into the red section um this is the last slide uh, what is important in an adolescent to set up when you are uh, looking at teenagers privacy should be ensured and uh, at this point i just want to say that when you are talking to a teenager of the opposite gender from yourself or the same gender it's always uh, uh, better to keep a chaperone uh, because teenagers may talk about homosexual uh, you know attractions so they may you may be at a position in a in a spot where they may think that you are abusing them so it is always uh, better to have some chaperone with you either the family mother or father if you are comfortable with them or another like you know nurse or somebody who works with you office personnel should be adolescent friendly so it's important to teach them also about the adolescent brain to understand adolescents are not be judgmental equipment like a blister jar important to have all these central charts and very very important for every uh, well adolescent visit to talk about adolescent uh, immunizations and also about the uh, breast self examination the pap smear testicular self examination these are all things which are important for uh, a well adolescent visit thank you thank you madam for that uh, wonderful presentation uh, there are no questions in the chat box but uh, i would like to ask you two questions one is what is the difference between consent and assent and number 2 is is this uh, adolescent history taking of heads model uh, actually relevant even in a difficult adolescence it is uh, uh, coming for the first question consent uh, assent is like for a younger adolescent consent is for an older adolescent and very often consent is basically dependent on the law so consent can be written or an oral consent but assent is usually a verbal assent to any kind of procedure like for example when you are uh, before you start you know removing clothes and examining a teenager if they say yes they agree for that you will go ahead and do it suppose they not uh, willing for examination of the genitalia like for a tanner staging for example you could show them a chart and say do you fit into any of these to uh, be able to uh, uh, change them consent is more uh, a formal written consent so consent can be given according to that Uh, a slide that i put up where you can give consent teenager can give consent 12 to 18 by law only for certain procedures and examination not for you know invasive treatment so that is the difference between consent and assent and heads assessment is important for all teenagers ideally every teenager whom you see is good to talk to them about each of these domains uh, basically to pick up uh, high risk behavior which will affect them in the future and give them Uh, what is called anticipatory guidance and talk to them about uh, uh, you know even if they say that they are not sexually active or they are not using any kind of substances it's important to talk to them and say why is it good or why is it bad to say for example smoke a cigarette so it's important for everybody thank you so much madam uh, next we'll move on to the second uh, topic of children sir sorry yes. to interrupt sir yes uh, sir uh, just to add to dr mona ma'am's thing so we have yes. something called the yes. shades uh, questionnaire 
which is a strength based questionnaire as you ask the question like it will be helpful in difficult adolescents and also for certain adolescents with uh, disability like learning disability there's another questionnaire called the co r e o m i'll share it in the chat box sir thank just you just to add on to ma'am's uh, thank you Dr. thank you sir thank you thank you sir uh, then the next topic will be basics of uh, adolescent counseling uh, which will be by our uh, uh, scientific committee member of aha dr m vijayrani uh, she is a graduate from stanley medical college post graduate from ich a pgdap from kerala university a practicing pediatrician and an adolescent health consultant passionate in adolescent health uh, counseling past secretary of uh, iap north arka chapter past south zone coordinator of adolescent chapter uh, contributed in mission kishore udai a module for adolescent health director of two schools in rani petai uh, areas of interest adolescent behavioral issues scholastic backwardness and mental health over to dr vijay rani thank you very much dr sendhu a uh, very good evening to one and all president secretary and the treasurer and my respects to all the seniors who are present here thank you very much for the opportunity you have given me here uh, let me share the screen delegates can uh, put their questions in the chat box yeah you can go for the full screen uh, ah okay yes. good yeah so uh, the topic of basic of adolescent counseling it's very very re relevant to this year's uh, uh international adolescent health week celebration that is with for adolescents building healthier and more inclusive future so this can be done only with the help of all our pediatricians and other doctors who are involved in counseling adolescents so heads while talking dr mona was telling about the importance of the health burden and uh, our uh, secretary president was telling about the numbers we are 14% uh, uh, of population in india it is 22% of the population who are adolescents so we are here we are going to deal with so many numbers and we need a healthy population and uh, we know uh, today's adolescents are going to become tomorrow's uh, adults so how do we go about it unless we are not taking up uh, counseling each and i know it is going to be really um a, a time consuming dealing with all our adolescents but somehow we have to devise a methodology so that we spend some time on essentials like when we do the psychosocial review when we do the heads we pick up uh, on the important aspect where we have to intervene and then from there on we have to take up counseling sessions let's see how we do it i may be unable to can you see my uh, thing or... yes it, uh, it's not moving yeah the slides next slide can you go to the next slide yeah i'm i'm unable to uh, then you stop sharing and then come back again okay. yes so the basic learning objectives will be to discuss how to establish trust and rapport with the adolescent without this we cannot move further along their direction and understanding effective counseling skills i'm sure all pediatrician 
we have withstood all those crying in the newborn ward and later in our OPs, where we, when it is uh, highly irritating for the common person, but pediatrician will never get unnerved by these uh, noises. And uh, we have great skill in steering the young mothers into breastfeeding. We've succeeded so many efforts in the past. Definitely our uh, counseling skills can be honed further to deal with our adolescents. And also to know the role of pediatrician in application of counseling in adolescents. So what is counseling? It is not just one way directive to the adolescent, but it's a two way communication. More people can be involved like the parents or the caretakers. We have to explore the feelings and emotions of the adolescents and facilitate them, ask them to uh, express their views and problems, identify their problem, facilitate decision making for them and guide them to resolve problem. We also have to enable the adolescents to make a decision and plan for their specific action. So the WHO defines counseling as a well-focused, uh, uh, sorry, counseling for a limited time and specific, which uses interaction with the adolescents to help deal with difficult situation and respond in the appropriate manner according to these specific situations. And it is not just telling the adolescents what to do. We just don't give them directives do or ad advices, do like this, do like that. Or we don't enforce our own values and attitudes or beliefs and uh, whatever. Uh, we don't give them our decisions to them. Uh, you have to follow this. Then only you will come out of your problem. And we should resist any assumptions. We cannot, uh, by seeing them or the way they attire, here is, and we should not assume or presume that this person is like this. So we have to give them this kind of advice so that they have to take it and solve their problems. And there is no one particular protocol or anything like that, that that will fit in this adolescent. Each adolescent is unique, have their own problems, and the solution must be uh, suitable for that particular adolescent. So it, one methodology will not be suitable for uh, any adolescent. Individually, we have to personalize the counseling. And uh, our adolescents, uh, sorry, counseling is not suitable for mentally unwell adolescents. So why do we need to counsel our adolescents? We know just now uh, she spoke about the developmental ch challenges from childhood to adulthood. We have an intermediate period where there's a lot of development taking place, not only physical, but mental, social, psychosocial, all these challenges that our adolescents are facing. Most of them uh, travel this phase smoothly, but there are many who ha have trouble, are turbulent, or for some, which is very, very difficult. Like there are so many situations like special children who are uh, physically disabled or family circumstances so so different. So they have a lot of challenges along with the stress and demands of this generation. What is happening? We are so much connected, connected with the media. At the same time, the world has shrunk. It has become very global. So anybody from the rural can be equally pressurized just like an urban-centered adolescent. And there are other peer pressures on them. And everything is happening very fast. They have to cope with this fastness. So a lot of demands are there for these adolescents. And it is very, very all the more important that we involve ourselves with them. Early detection and guidance for scholastic problems is very, very essential because I basically think our education system, especially in India, either it is flawed or it is not suitable for all our children and the academics are boxed and uh, uh, the adolescents will have to fit in these uh, into these boxes, which is an impossibility. So what are the scholastic problems? Are there inherent problems or which is external? We have to find them, detect, assess and guide them. So we ne definitely need to counsel them. Mental health disorders are on the rise. 40% of the mental health disorders arise during adolescence. It's very, very important that we pick up early and guide them. 
nutrition and physical activity related we are going to see our next uh, firebrand speaker is going to tell us more about it and uh, definitely every op just like breastfeeding under five nutrition we have to talk to our adolescents about adolescent nutrition and the importance of physical activity if that is not there then we have to step into the next step of serial counseling suicide is the third leading cause of death in adolescents very shameful and tamil nadu is also ranking very high in suicide rate uh, which is uh, very sad and also it is very very important we detect early and refer risk taking behavior uh, like dr mona said why the risk taking behavior is there in adolescents we have to guide them the right way and digital addiction um, definitely uh, we need to step in we are already uh, doing lot there is lot of damage that is happening and uh, we have to uh, take appropriate step regarding that parental conflicts and uh, adolescent needs this happens in every home so these are all simple things and but it is a very big issue for the adolescent they may come to seek the parents may come to seek help or the adolescent may come with their parents so a small intervention or small counseling can help ward off these uh, uh, problems the conflicts again the emotional problems in the adolescent the romantic relationships and love breaks or they have lot of phobias or depression small things will appear to be very big issue and uh, they are really concerned and body image it's uh, uh, what we are seeing is only tip of the iceberg uh, we have to detect early and uh, sort it out again uh, digital addiction is on a really a bad scene and also we have game addiction disorders which we have to take immediate action counseling really helps in a lot of way at least to ameliorate the situation that is that we are facing now again the these are main problems uh, other than what generally we see the problems in adolescent adjustment difficulties recently uh, i saw an adolescent in a very affluent school uh, who had lot of uh, problems with the peers then uh, the school management had called me to talk to the adolescent then she spoke throughout her uh, talk with me she was able to say she was saying i am overthinking i am overthinking and she was able to tell her problem her, how her uh, uh, peers had been prior to two months and how she has difficulty she she had paranoid uh, uh, thing about the friends that they are always talking about her and then she was smiling throughout she, her uh, emotional expression was not coherent so i just put a word are you hearing voices and then she said yes and then she said how many times and we took it from there then her parents were called and they had also suspected this and they thought always it was the pressure of pay, paying the fees and she getting adjusted to her friends but later when she was referred to the psychiatrist then she was found to have adjustment disorder and probably an imminent uh, uh, psychosis that has been detected early so these are small things the school also will have to be very aware of uh, adolescent problems they have to have a counselor and they have to have tie up with doctors where they can take their children adolescents and uh, any suspicion these such things can be done just uh, stressing the role of a counselor in a school scholastic backwardness is very very important we have large majority of children uh, we are handling throughout india who are go going to schools but we don't have special teachers or special educators or special screening facilities or remedial things that is going to cater to our children we have to detect early because uh, it can add on to lower self esteem or they it can push them to violence or anti social behavior or even high risk behaviors and getting them addicted so these are all problems where pediatricians can intervene of course personality disorders detect early refer them non assertive adolescent is a big problem where we need to step in to give life skills to them 
and other of course i know some psychiatric disorders like depression adhd conversion reaction and many more so how are we going to go about this first we have to facilitate the behavior change that would be our main aim enhancing coping skills to bring about this behavior change and then the promote decision making when we are giving a better uh, self esteem this gives them this emboldens them to make decisions and improving relationships with peers with family with parents with teachers and in society society in general and facilitating potentials of the reason we have to detect when you doing the psychosocial review you will find that you where the weaknesses are where their strengths are from there you can take and then strengthen their potentials and for the counselor the how how we all can be a good counselor first we have to understand and realize their difficulties empathetic we have to be empathetic non judgmental see however much we have our own views or however conservative or outgoing whatever be it we cannot judge an adolescent through our eyes but we have to understand the adolescent very very scientifically give them a patient hearing we have to be a good listener i know in a in a busy day you cannot do these thing have a separate day for adolescent minimum 30 minutes is required or up to it can go up to 15 minutes so if you plan for a head review later counseling you need separate time where you have to give a patient listening and of course you have to maintain confidentiality be patient with them they may not open up even in the first or second visits and then build trust they have to trust you that you they can confide in you that amount of trust adolescents have to have in you and we have to be resourceful we have to once we find a problem where this uh, adolescent can take help what else kind of uh, help the adolescent can take all these resources we must be uh, adequate enough to Uh, help the adolescent and also definitely adolescent friendly dr mona spoke about the brain development and the risk taking behavior if we understand the brain development of an adolescent then we will not we will be more, much more patient in under, understanding a uh, early adolescent with the middle adolescent uh, uh, stage and the later adolescent and even beyond up to 25 years where uh, the maturation still take place so and also we can give these inputs to the parents so they also un- understand the adolescent that they are not doing it wantonly why they are emotionally charged why there are mood swings and why there is a risk taking behavior and uh, how they will have uh, happiness how they can be directed towards the happiness related issue so they don't go into risk taking behaviors again the skills it's very very important we build rapport listen actively that is patient hearing exclusive for the adolescent we have to be very observant how their body language is you cannot just see them and think a person who is uh, well dressed or very very modern let us not think this uh, person is this adolescent is going to be very outgoing very confident she may be she or he may be the person having the lowest self esteem and has concealed with all these uh, outside uh, thing due to peer pressure so your observing capacity the body language is all very very important be understanding approachable and patient emotional support is needed they may not get from the different kinds of families which she which dr mona had uh, uh, described they may not have emotional support at home we may have to give some amount of emotional support and direct them to seek wherever it is possible guide decision making and uh, whenever we detect something uh, even everything is normal but there is there is a chance that uh, the adolescent can get into trouble their anticipatory guidance can be said and uh, we must be trustworthy show respect to adolescent use of uh, uh, good non uh, a sexual humor or non uh, without any affecting and the words must be very uh, guarded we have to motivate them and see whether they have inherent motivation 
and use these potentials in the reality oriented yeah some adolescents are brought uh, for uh, asking for uh, for example some bike or to be admitted along with their friends in a different school which they cannot afford so so many things you can pick up and tell them the reality or there can be some change their body image issue where some things cannot be changed can our height be changed no but there can be something which can add to the uh, body image issue which can uh, help the adolescent so we have to really orient them orient them to reality and give them simple direct uh, answers and uh, check their body language as well as we have to be very careful about our body language how we project ourselves to the adolescents and we must have genuine concern for the adolescent stages of counseling first is relationship building only when there is trust the adolescent will open up and talk to us later we have to assess what exactly is the issue and is there a diagnosis is there a problem and then what are the counseling goals going to be what are we going to tell which is important first and how are we going to uh, direct this adolescent towards achieve, achieving the problem solving issue and then intervening and problem solving once these things are guided and you are confident the adolescent is going to do it ahead or you've seen that adolescent is attempting to do the problem solving issue then we we can terminate the counseling and ask them to come for follow up all these things can be analyzed later evaluation and can be used for further helping the adolescent establishing rapport how are we going to do that so first we have the gather uh, methodology also first introduce yourself and shake hands with the adolescent also introduce the other uh, people coming and you can greet them have eye contact smile and greet pleasant have a pleasant demeanor however busy you had been previously or if you had been uh, working on a very stressful uh, case explain how we are going to proceed you have to tell them who the patient is who, who your patient is the adolescent will be your patient and how we are going to think uh, proceed that you are going to have a joint session first with the parent later you may ask the parent to be outside and talk to the uh, adolescent and when you are talking the confidentiality what you are going to reveal what you are not going to reveal must be said like in case of any threat to the life we have to tell the parent or any other abuse etc we we have to reveal to the parents monitor your language yeah we have to see to that we do not use any negative words in our language and also very sensitive uh, words and try to avoid and use a uh, but very simple understanding words and we can please do not get into the shoes of a parent and behave like a parent and give them advice but we have to be like a scientific person and give them the right counseling what is right and uh, for the right and safe for the adolescent and keep appropriate physical distance excuse me the eye contact and body the picture excuse itself me, uh, tells us. Uh, just uh, uh, can you finish it in one minute two no. minutes two I'll minutes just... okay okay please proceed so effective listening already dr mona said we have to really listen actively we oh, can take Ask another 5 minutes please uh, go to the previous slides yeah this uh, uh, thing says if you are not going to have eye contact if you are going to be involved in something else the adolescent is not going to reveal to you anything active listening is very very important body language like have having your hand like this and sitting in front of the adolescent will say you are not interested and ask questions and uh, encourage the adolescent to talk don't cut in between and uh, stop we have to ask open ended question is why what where how all these things use brief comments paraphrase suppose uh, the adolescent is unable to say fully or you want your adolescent to understand see uh, you can rephrase what the adolescent has said and ask back and then close uh, questions can be asked if the question is very sensitive and do not use direct questions like uh, do you uh, do you have sexual contact with your boyfriend like that directly which may be very embarrassing for the adolescent and you during the period of silence 
you can uh, uh, observe the uh, adolescent and also tell the gist of it and use it for counseling. Negotiation is very, very important. Set the agenda, assess motivation of the adolescent and confidence. So from there you can proceed. And uh, decision making should not be the decision making of the doctor, but you have to assist, give them choices and make them select and decide. Goal setting, you should be aimed at behavior modification. So we know already where all the areas of counseling should be. And uh, specifically health risk behavior, these things have been applied previously. We have to take every moment to uh, cover these areas. Types of counseling can be you identify the problem and refer, like I said, the example, or identify the problem and we can educate them. Like uh, suppose a child comes with scholastic backwardness, if it is something uh, suitable for um, and minimally that can be done with education, we, uh, we can give them strategies or uh, we can give them add on skill building, which can be done by us or can be sent to a psychologist or other uh, who are going to be in our team. Or problem identification, supportive listening and recommendation. Like if the father is an alcoholic and the uh, adolescent is uh, uh, disturbed, you can do a patient and supportive listening and recommend how to avoid situation, especially while uh, uh, studying or doing other activities. So there are various type of counseling, individual, which can be couple and family along with them, or group counseling, which can be homogeneous, heterogeneous, can be an open group or a closed group. And uh, motivational interviewing is very, very important now, added to a part of counseling along with CBT and other modalities. Uh, this uh, particular interviewing was uh, uh, devised by William Miller and Stephen Rolnick. It's based on internal motivation. It's worked very well for uh, smoking addiction and uh, some other uh, drug addiction. So where uh, there is a lot of failure, if the adolescent herself or himself is having the motivation internally, they can be steered into taking a better step towards uh, the addiction. And the message is uh, counseling is an important modality of treatment for adolescent related problems. And definitely pediatricians have an active role. We all have to take an active role in helping our adolescents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijayarani. It was a a fantastic session and we know that you have been doing counseling for so many years and helping adolescents in your area and in your schools so definitely as pediatricians we are the gatekeepers and we have to take adolescents into our fold because we are going to see definitely in the ncds becoming uh, rising every day uh, we are going to deal about these adolescents. We have to know what is their problems and we have to give them anticipatory guidance and counsel them. And definitely uh, in the trending issues in today's world, fast paced world, paced world, and of course, after post-COVID, we are going to uh, definitely face problems and pediatricians should definitely know about these basics. So one question to Dr. Vijayarani. So, uh, do you really, after counseling, uh, do they produce the required results? For example, say, uh, screen time, uh, a child coming with a screen time, increased screen time, and they have been addicted. And uh, do you, they really produce results after this counseling? Yeah. It all depends on how much they are addicted. If it is minimal, and if the parents are cooperative, definitely we can give best, best results slowly and steadily. But if it is too much, and if there is always, you can see the complexity in family. But definitely, there will be a little bit of uh, uh, change in the adolescent. There will be, we have to keep on repeating because that is going to be a pleasure seeking activity, which the neural pathway has become strong. It will take longer time. We should not lose heart in not counseling the adolescent. We have to do it repeatedly repeatedly take the family also into confidence and they have to follow suit along with the adolescent. Definitely we will reach. Of course, there are other areas where we, we may fail. Thank you. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yes. Okay, next session. Welcome to Dr. Hashila Ayahu.
uh, she will be talking on uh, practical aspects of uh, obesity management. She is a pediatric endocrinologist and a diabetic specialist. She's finished her DCH, DNB, and PhD in pediatric endocrinology from New Zealand. So she is working presently at GKNM Hospital, Coimbatore, the Masonic Medical Center for Children as a consultant. So she is the president this year for the Indian Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology. The, she has got the John Funder Prize for Best PhD Student Research Publication in 2013. Liggins Institute and nominated for top 18 doctoral thesis at University of Auckland, New Zealand. She has got various publications in JCEM, American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Clinical Endocrinology, Journal of Pediatrics, Future Cardiology and Journal of Endocrine Society and IJ Indian Journal of Pediatrics. So she is a reviewer of Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, Indian Pediatrics and Frontiers in Endocrinology. After this post-COVID, we are seeing so many uh, children with overweight and obesity, of course, especially adolescents. So let us go over to Dr. Ahila Ayavu for our topic. Over to Dr. Ahila. I think uh, <laughs> I looked at the participants and I thought mostly everybody is from Tamil Nadu. Uh, but uh, I enjoy, I think my uh, treatment of obesity would depend on our counseling rather than anything else. So I've got a lot of details on slides that I think you can pick up from the internet and in your personal experience. So I will go ahead with the way we counsel. And I think I'm a deep, uh, what do you say, an ardent fan of Dr. Ismail. Uh, in the way he counsels adolescents. So you will see a lot of similarity. He is a little bit nulla uh, doctor, na konja keta doctor. So that's how we both counsel <laughs> our patients. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Sendhil. And uh, thanks to Dr. Suresh Balan, uh, Dr. Tirumurugan, Dr. Gopal, Dr. Dakshayani, Dr. Rajendran, and all our friends here. And for all of you who are awake at 10 o'clock, listen to an absurd lecture on how to counsel adolescents about obesity. So, actually, it's a horrible feeling for the parent, the child, and myself when we enter into our conversation. So, as Dr. Vijayrani and, uh, uh, was uh, talking about how she counsels, I really thought she's such a wonderful person. My patients would appreciate her better than me because uh, sometimes they think they've gotten into the consultation room of a devil when they get into my room. We start off and then we go become friends, a bit of enemies. And then finally end up as friends at the end of our session. That's how it goes. So first aid we start. So in the biscuit pidi Cream biscuit the pudding. Yet the biscuits are the car in a pal or sapia, coffee or sapia, tea or sapia, yet the tumbler copy veno, other non which is sapia, other which is sapia, in a total to sapia. So we are start off like that. So they will be very happy. Okay. So now she's gotten into my uh, lovely uh, food, which uh, is my biscuit and pal or bun and biscuit, bun and pal. Bun and tea is a very favorite food of all people in Tamil Nadu. And they think it is the staple food which has come from the Sangam era in Tamil Nadu. So now everybody thinks any food other than biscuit, uh, uh, bun and tea or biscuit and milk is a horrible breakfast. That's the best breakfast anybody can have. So that is where we start and then we go on from there. Uh, then we start, okay, kalela breakfast, kena sabha. My child eats only four doses. Okay, what time do they get up? My child is very tired at the end of the day. He was watching after his tuition, which he comes back in the evening. He goes for four hours of tuition, comes back and relaxes in front of the TV, plays a little bit of video games for two hours and goes to sleep at 12 o'clock. And then when the morning he's so tired, he can't get up at all. He gets up and has his cup of tea and bun or some biscuits and pal. And then he's so hurried and is getting ready and he runs away to school. And then in the school, he gets uh, again another session of biscuits. And for lunch, uh, it is a good lunch, which is, has only one dubber of rice and uh, some fried potatoes. Uh, potato tigeri, as far as everybody in Tamil Nadu is concerned, green vegetables is only for the goats, not for humans. So that is how our children also like it. And the parents feel very satisfied after all the hard work I've put into earning a living in this world. I'm feeding my child. And I don't mind if the 
mouth acts like a because all this habit starts when they are very young so the first weaning food is actually biscuit milk bikkis is the first weaning food rather than any idli or ragi kool or anything so you you can't blame the children for what they develop we put the first brick on the uh, <coughs> building and started the process there so that there are some things which you can modify in life and some you cannot modify in life so there are modifiable risk factors and unmodifiable risk factors a child being born small for gestational age is beyond your control a child has 30% or a five time risk of increased metabolic disorders in later life by boy being born sga but you can alter that by having a good lifestyle which we fail to initiate so first you start weaning with biscuits then you mash up everything in the mixture mixi la eduthu you put some rice some uh, carrot and some and it will be like one kalni thanni which even one erva madu will not take and then they will say the child will spit on your face paandi ettite irukke yaar enna seiyo adha manasil thippa na na i always ask and then you actually then you start feeding every time the child there, there was one child somebody accidentally told the mother your child is cooking thin so I, the child weighed 8 kg at 10 months of age and by the time the child reached 18 months the child was 18 kg because the mother will keep feeding and the child said uh, and then she'll feed again till it keeps it down the father said na love panida en wife kalyana panna ipo prasama divorce pannila man yosichu ke appdi sonna so i told the mother you take a step away you're not going to feed the child put the feed in front of the child if it spits on your face let it be go away so first you have to understand the child has appetite and satiety which you have to allow it to develop and that starts in early infancy and goes on to 3 years of age when you force feed a child you initiated a very bad vicious cycle of the child eating even when they are not hungry and they eat for comfort and happiness rather than for settling their appetite and achieving satiety that is why it is important to allow the child to feed on their own even if they eat i always tell them or why it will be your child can run 100 km just step away your calculation of what the child should eat is not actually what is right for the child so we established the bad habit and there's no point in blaming the child for what's come now so usually the most important uh, part of indian culture and civilization is to have progeny so that namma varisu namma vamsam valarano you can be anything but you have to be alive to have one vamsam that is where people fail to recognize so this is particularly i'm not blaming anyone so usually police families are something which is notorious for bringing a child and worrying only about having a child so they come for not for obesity they come for buried penis and then when you show that they will ask perusa nalla kolandilla pandu first perusa avanu apperam kolandu therku use so it is a gunda alaga round a irundha kolandu vandu aarogyamana kolandu in 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 tamil nadu if you have a round child kushbu was always more famous than the thinner simran so you should remember we have always have a culture for liking obese people in tamil nadu so that's a very favorite uh, in tamil nadu if you are thin you are considered or if you are fit you are slim not considered beautiful so when you look at the child as if the child is obese for them it is a beautiful rounded child and you are trying to put an evil eye on the child kannu vechi a pulla vaalki kedutraringa that is that is why when they come to me I, they are in a much favorable mind with than when they meet their pediatricians because a no pediatrician can tell them your child is wrong they will change the pediatrician but by the time they come to me they already real, have realized that this child is not actually doing well so you can actually have lot of complications including obstructive sleep apnea but all that your family is worried about is that you did not get good marks so what is definition of obesity so now a little bit of academic material also so a condition of excessive fat accumulation that would impair health there is no specific definition you have to remember if the child is ill because of excess weight gain which does not suit the child then that is obesity and that is what is obesity rather than any specific definition the bmi which you say more than or equal to 85% for age and sex on growth chart is overweight and more than or equal to 95% of bmi is obesity is a actually a crude marker for the population rather than an individual so weight in kilograms per square of height in meters is just a calculation that does not indicate your health so we actually have become in earlier days our growth charts were different now even your 50 kg seems to be only on the 
85th or 97th centile for a 10 year old child so um, whenever they have a normal child in the family they feel the child is thin because everybody is around and kundu when you have a normal uh, lean child then that child becomes ill looking this is a nice beautiful uh, growth chart on bmi which uh, the recent uh, uh, charts have come out from the iap and it's very easy to mark on these charts you don't have to look at calculate your bmi and all that you look at the height on this uh, x axis and the uh, weight on the y axis and your mark it will come as normal weight overweight or obesity this at least gives an indication or a picture to show the family to say the child is not well so this is our regular bmi charts i think vaman has done extremely well on these for having calculated the 85th and the 97th centile and saying 95th centile to uh, mark adolescent and these are equivalents of asian weights that is 27 equivalent is obesity in india and 23rd and more equivalent is overweight and not like 25 and 30 in the western population but the much more significant one would be waist hip circumference or waist circumference so idai alagi sandilian book padichirundalo seri endha andha kaalathu tamil book padichirundalo idai siruthu appra irukiradhu vandha so a waist hip ratio of less than 1 is a healthy your gynoid ratio or fat in the gynoid region is not unhealthy it is the fat in the android region which is unhealthy so any kalyana maple which comes with the toppe tonging is an unhealthy man so that is the android pack so that's very simple you will never forget what is android pack any new maple who has a dondi is has more android pack if it is gynoid pack he will be lean alaga irpan kalyana mudichone ay nimme enna vena pannikala then they put on fat that is the android gynoid ratio any android gynoid ratio of more than 0.7 is unhealthy in boys and more than 0.8 in girls is unhealthy so waist hip circumference is a much more important metabolic marker than a bmi because indian sub population as a whole has a very very high risk for metabolic disorders for the same weight any other ethnic population in the world would be metabolically more healthy than south asians we are at a higher risk for heart disease stroke cancer diabetes and hypertension at very earlier weight gains compared to any other population in the world so it's important to remember your waist circumference and the toppe which is tonging is the worst thing that you can ever have in your life so this is the prevalence of obesity in uh, delhi but look at that that was a 2008 paper so that talked about overweight in 15.3 and 6.8 obesity uh, delhi in the high income group it was not very low in the low income group but you can see a shift in the exhibition or the presentation of obesity now and particularly post covid now i would say there are very few population in tamil nadu who are not affluent in terms of having food there is nobody who lacks food in this state with 25 kilograms of rice and masala saman being given free and 100 naal velai thittum there is nobody without food in this state so anything extra you earn and there is nothing less than 500 rupees even if you work in a field and that if you don't drink you have enough for enough and more to buy chips packet which is only 5 rupees less is 5 rupees tide mide is 5 rupees 10 rupees then one uh, uh, anything so all the chips you can get for 5 rupees but if you buy apple or if you buy any koya palam that will be 100 rupees so healthy food is more costly than unhealthy food and they are colorfully wrapped எப்படி இருந்தால் ரோட்டோரமா மண்ணோரமா தான் இருக்கும் எல்லா காய பழமும் ஆனா அழக தொங்கும் சிப்ஸ் பேக்கெட் அவர தொடச்சாக்கு இன்னும் கலர் தேங்கும் தட் இஸ் வெரி வெரி குட் எனிவே தே ஆர் டிமாண்டிங் அண்ட் புல்லிங் யூ இன் டு தட் பேட் லைஃப் ஸ்டைல் ஆஃப் ஒபிசிட்டி பை பேக்கேஜிங் அண்ட் ப்ரொஜெக்டிங் விச் அட்ராக்ட் சில்ட்ரன் இஃப் யூ லுக் அட் த கலர்ஸ் யூ வுட் ஹவ் சீன் தி அமௌண்ட் ஆஃப் ரிசர்ச் தட் வுட் ஹவ் பார்ன் இன் பை தி ரிச பை தி ஃபுட் கம்பெனிஸ் இன் டு மேக்கிங் இட் த மோஸ்ட் அட்ராக்டிவ் கலர்ஸ் ஃபார் சில்ட்ரன் it attracts children more than any adult and that is where they pull you into that um, world of uh, going into a, a bad world down a downhill on your health this is prevalence in urban india in another paper in 2011 but look at what was published in 2020 from chennai from acs medical college i really like this paper so they looked at overweight and obesity and this was 5.6% in rural areas and it is 26% in urban areas it was healthy and underweight 94.4% are healthy and this is 74% in the olden days when we were in school anybody weighing more than 40 kg in 10th standard was considered undu 
if when if anybody is weighing 40 kg in 10 standard now they are only are weak satte satte illa pulla noja meri it is thinking that is the shift in paradigm shift in the way people have started interpreting how their child should look look at the urban area it's horrible it's 26% we are nearing the 30% cut off which is the worst uh, obese pattern that you can see and that is in the us and i think we are not far off from reaching that we will probably reach it in a couple of years and bypass the us population so they've already also looked at the binging pattern in these children and what did they find so the urban children about 41 42% binge and they get uh, when they binge they are obese and overweight if you look at the rural population it pretty less the binging is far less and they are healthy also much more healthier in the rural population compared to the urban population but we are not far behind in our uh, rural population too so acanthosis uh, nigricans i don't think i have to explain to anyone plus remember chinna chinna da kurtu kurta varu kalathile that is a skin tag and that is also a marker of hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance it's not only acanthosis so we fail to think of that that is almost nearing type 2 diabetes when you have uh, the karupu kurtu kurta vara its skin tags are a marker of insulin resistance this is stretch mark sometimes children just go and shoot up on the height that time also you may see this stretch marks but when it comes along with obesity i always tell the parents this plastic bag was small made for 10 kg when you fill it with 50 kg it will cringe away so the skin is tearing apart because it cannot hold all the fat you have in your body so this is the explanation for skin stretch marks i think you have to get down to the level of the parents to make them understand what they are looking at in future so this is one of our patients he was uh, 48 kg at 6 years of age we told him diet and exercise all his investigations were normal again they told we, they thought we were keeping an eye, evil eye on the doctor evil eye on the child then they came back at 8 years of age he was 78 kg and then he came back at 10 years he was 150 kg with quick quick weekend syndrome he had been sitting and sleeping for the last 18 years when he lies down he will have instant cardiac arrest and die he had complete liver failure because of obesity non alcoholic fatty liver disease his blood pressure was 200 by 140 He had obstructive sleep apnea, complete liver failure, and Pickwickian syndrome. He said nothing can be done. We put him on BiPAP and sent him home, and he walked continuously for three weeks and lost thirty kgs. Why couldn't the parent have done better? Varumun kapum. Prevention is better than cure. There is no point in going to this level and worrying about where you're going to lose your child. It's a blessing. Now, all of me said that. ஒரு குழந்தைய குறை இல்லாம பெறுவதற்கு நீங்க கொடுத்து வச்சிருக்கோம் அதுல ஆகாயத்துல போற சனியனை வீட்டுக்கு வந்துட்டு போன சோறு போட்டு கூப்பிடுறதுங்கிறது இதுதான் ஒபிசிட்டி யூ ஆர் கிவிங் ஃபுட் ஃபார் த டெவில் அண்ட் ஆஸ்கிங் இட் டு விசிட் யுவர் சைல்ட் அண்ட் கிவ் த இல்னஸ் டு த சைல்ட் இன் யுவர் சைல்ட் வாஸ் ஆக்சுவலி பிளஸ் டு ஹவ் பீன் பார்ன் ஹெல்தி அண்ட் இட் நீட் நாட் ஹவ் அரைவ்ட் அட் திஸ் பிளேஸ் சோ திஸ் இஸ் அ சைல்ட் அண்ட் நவ் ஹி இஸ் கம் பேக் அட் எயிட்டீன் இயர்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஏஜ் வித் அ வெயிட் ஆஃப் ஹண்ட்ரட் அண்ட் எயிட்டி செவன் கேஜிஸ் ஐ ஹவ் சென்ட் அம் ஃபார் பேரியாட்ரிக் சர்ஜரி you have to achieve at least 5% weight loss from your present weight before you become fit enough for bariatric surgery and i also say what procedure is done and how to be monitor you don't remember you people don't tell you what are the complications you face post bariatric surgery you give bariatric surgery as an option telling them you will lose the child if you don't do that's why you're doing it kodal kilichu paadi eduttu poita thirupi ella kondu ullar vekkum you lost it forever and if you have a ruin why dumping syndrome can make your life miserable you can have such a horrible post bariatric surgery complications unless you are ready enough to face it it is better to go ahead with just regular diet and exercise so we always tell patients the treatment of diet and it's 65% diet modification 34% exercise medications and other treatment modality would be only 1% for your child i think all of you would know about genetics epigenetics environment the next most important point i always try to tell you is sleep manushana parakapatta men ellarume irutana thoonu poludhu vidinja endirikkum you have been made that way you are based your life is based on the way the sun sets and the sun rises early to bed early to rise makes a man healthy wealthy and wise it is how your hypothalamus is modeled 
if you go to and follow your circadian rhythm, your risk for metabolic disorders almost come down a significant proportion by having proper sleep. Then that is why having and switch off your electronics at least two to three hours before you go off to sleep. I always tell families, COVID up a cell phone my good, COVID up a cell phone my good. Yeah, I also tell them, see, your child is not listening to you. So if your child tells you, tear a, a 2,000 rupee note and throw it away, will you throw it away? So do you think your child's health is much less important than a 2,000 rupees note? Ask them, I dare you to tear a 100 rupee note and tell, show me that you will tear it. Don't you think your child's life is more precious than that? So it is up to you to teach them what is right. But you can teach them in a nicer way, like how Dr. Vijarani said. You give them, always try to involve them in team sports. Then they have friends. It's nice. I don't consider cricket a sport at all. I always tell them to go for football, basketball, hockey and volleyball. And never in the goal post. You have to run. Your friends will kick you in the butt if you don't save a goal. If you allow a goal to the opposite team, they will break you apart. So I tell them to go as a forward. Or you go in defense and if you don't allow a single goal, all your friends will show you how to play better. So it's team sports make it interesting. They don't lose interest. You ask them to run, they will say no. And then you ask the parent, the exercise Oh yes, my child does skipping. How many? 20. That is about 2 minutes. 5,000 jumps take 50 minutes. Then did your child, uh, my child walks on the treadmill. What speed? 4.0. That is like, if you walk, that is, that is 4.0. Anything less than 6.3 kilometers per hour is not an exercise at all. If you want to halve the risk of diabetes, it should be 25 minutes of weightlifting for at least five days of the week to reduce your risk for metabolic, risk for metabolic disorders. And I'm not asking you to lift 50 kgs and 100 kgs. Just 2 kg dumbbells, do some biceps curl, triceps curl, hammer curl, and some more of those weights and they really help you in bringing your weight down. Make it the sports interesting and not horrifying. So time, I think, time is a bit yeah. constrained. Okay, that's all. We'll finish. So this is one of my boys. You have to, you have to tell us the practical aspects. We will not allow you. Neither practical. Why all of us? Neither practical. I don't know. Yeah. So this is one of my boys who's been an inspiration for us. He had a rheumatic heart disease, multivalvular disease, and he could use only diet to lose weight. And this was the effect of steroids. And look at how he went ahead and lost weight only with dietary control. So. You can have rare causes of secondary uh, obesity. I would also think about lipid partitioning. I'm seeing a lot of dyslipidemia in children. Again, six months of diet and exercise, if it does not work, you have to initiate treatment. But I think you should remember any medicine, not to marnanol, we to marnanol, modern medicine, everything. If you take two mouthfuls of water, you have to go to the toilet once. So if you drink water, going passing urine is a side effect. So when you have can have side effect for a for water, you may not, you cannot ask for more side effects for any drug. Any drug may produce a side effect, but it may be one in 10,000 or one in a lakh. But unless absolutely necessary, medications are not the answer for treatment for childhood obesity. It's the last and the least important. So the only thing, the metabolic syndrome, this, what does it say? It tells you how soon you're going to develop metabolic disorder or heart disease. And like you're seeing younger and younger boys, even overweight children developing myocardial infarction at 20 years, 21 years of GKNF time. And that's heartbreaking. You don't want your child to go through that. Without health, there's no point in having any wealth. You can have million dollars in your hand. And without wealth, it doesn't matter what you do. That's what we tell our parents also. And blood pressure again, that if you do more cardiac exercises, you can bring your blood pressure also under control. And again, we try drugs only after six months. So I think bone age, to see advancement, we do a oral glucose tolerance test and a HbA1c, a lipid profile, a fasting lipid profile. And when they are very obese, we definitely look for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Thyroid is not the most common cause. I would say it's a very, very rare cause of Obesity, probably the only reason we do thyroid is there is something called because of obesity, you may have a rise in PSH and you don't have to treat them because of that. You have to bring down the weight effect from the leptin in your body due to being obese and that is altering your TSH and you have the full function TSH or TFT before you think of adding a medication. So lifestyle modification, lifestyle modification, lifestyle modification, which includes only diet and exercise. 
and it can be as a social intervention from the school, from the family, and the pharmacotherapy would be the least important. So insulin resistance or on the way or almost on the verge of becoming a diabetic. In pre-diabetes, I definitely start uh, metformin. Hirsutism, we treat them with anti-androgens. Dyslipidemia, I start statins a bit later, not very early. At least a year or so, we give time for diet and exercise. And hypertension is something we do. So this is one of my patients with hirsutism. I've seen her as a 10-year-old. She did not listen to me. And you remember, when you counsel, you have to have both the parents and the child in the because there will be one parent who will always be a buffer and try to shield the child from your counseling. Whereas one parent will be truthful and say, X -X that is something one parent will say, the other parent will not say. So you would have to have both the parents and you should, both the parents should not agree with each other. Then you will get the best history out of the family. We do see pseudotumor cerebri. We are seeing Perthes disease quite frequently. We are seeing a lot of obstructive sleep apnea. I'm working with Anthony on that and I've got a few patients on BiPAP. I'm seeing Rohat syndrome. I'm seeing cholelithiasis, early and delayed puberty and polycystic ovarian syndrome. And all of these manifestations we are seeing in our clinic every day. So this is one of, again, our success stories. who lost eight kgs and went on to antiandrogens. And she's the same girl. Kindly, she wore the same kamal and came. Uh, six months later, she had lost weight. She had improved on all her metabolic outcomes. So this is again one of our parents who gave us kind enough to give a photograph. This was 11-year-old with 68 kgs pre-diabetes, hypertension, and also having dyslipidemia. In six months, she lost uh, almost 25 kgs of only diet and exercise. The mother said, even if she fails in school, my child is my life. I will see to it that she becomes better. And only with diet and exercise and no medication. <clears throat> this is another of our boys from Kumbakonam. Look at the gynecomastia, and this is again the same marker. He's got a tendency for keloid, only diet and exercise. He became a sculptor and lost all his weight. And he said, he'll, yeah, because he had a tendency for keloid, we did not want to do surgery. So he went and said, I will build a six pack. I'll let the breast of the area, madam. I said, go, fantastic. Go away and enjoy your life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hila. Uh, it was a uh, really, I didn't say, pada, 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 pada. It was like an Aruvi Kotramar in the Thank you so much and uh, for your uh, wonderful session. And let us uh, move on to the next uh, session. Please thank stop. you so much. Sorry. Thank Thanks for putting up with me. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Please stop sharing. <laughs> uh, welcome to Dr. Nityananda from Bangalore. Uh, he's my wonderful friend and uh, he's a senior specialist in HOD of Pediatrics. He was previously in the ESA hospital and uh, he is a passionate uh, personality with a PGDAP and a PGDHR degree. And uh, he's actually the uh, president elect for the medical legal chapter of uh, IAP. And so uh, let us move on to his uh, topic. Now, presently, he is in. Uh, Siddhartha Medical College, Bangalore, in the pediatric department. And so we'll, we would like to know from him because he would have seen a lot of uh, patients in his government service and now also. So what a pediatrician should know about POXO Act. Over to Dr. Nityanda. Please. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Chantil. After hearing an hilarious talk by Dr. Aila and then uh, uh, the other talks, very informative and useful uh, talks by Dr. Vijayarani, whom I know, and then the one of us also in the full talk. So I know a few persons here, uh, apart from uh, my dear friend Chantil, and then uh, Dr. Shiva Prakashan is there. Of course, a lot of people, Gita Patil. So a lot of people are there, whom I know. Thank you for calling me to give a talk on this book. So, so you know that uh, it has been kept in the end. Uh, uh, because, you know, all legal procedures, usually they draw a lot of time and then the decision will be taken very late. <laughs> but it is not, fortunately, it is not going to happen in case of uh, OXO, where there is a time limit, time frame, and then it is being, uh, reports are being there. So decisions, as far as the children are concerned, they are going to uh, be taken early and fast. So shall I start sharing the uh, yeah, thing? Yeah. 
loading it's it's coming okay. as loading loading can i share yeah can i think uh, i'll share it yeah 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 i'll start sharing then yes okay okay you can share Yeah. Next, next one. Okay, so uh, this Pokhra uh, Act came into existence in the year 2012. That was on 14th November. Probably it is a welcome change as far as the uh, protection against sexual, uh, child sexual abuses or offenses. Uh, you know, because there were, it, it is not that there are no laws against this act or sexual abuse for the children. And there were IPC Act and there were IT Acts and then even the Juvenile Justice Act was also there 2000. Uh, 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 2000. But uh, those are, uh, they had their own fallacies and then the loopholes where uh, they're not addressing comprehensively as far as the child uh, sexual offenses are concerned. Therefore, uh, the folks are with all the pressure and you know the history, which I don't want to get into. Uh, so with all that to you and cry and a lot of media influence, this act came into existence. And I'll discuss what is uh, child sexual abuse and this lens and the magnitude of the problem, overview of the POCSO Act, when to suspect uh, these abuses, reporting, whom to report, when to report, and whom all to this thing. And what is the complication is not reported. That is also. And uh, later we'll discuss about medical examination. Next slide, sir. So as a pediatrician, I just highlight the uh, uh, points here that uh, what a pediatrician should know about uh, this uh, POCSO Act. Uh, so again, disclaimer, of course, is only for the academic purpose. So how do we define this child sexual abuse? So we should know that the involvement of a child in sexual activity that he or she does not fully comprehend. So it includes both sexes, males and females, which are not addressed earlier, and is unable to give informed consent. So why? Because for which the child is not developmentally prepared and cannot give consent. And also, there are laws, uh, there are so many sections, not only under uh, this uh, BOXO Act, as well as under IPC Act. So if that the the if, if violates if that the violates law that laws probably they'll be punished. Next slide. And uh, even there are societal considerations also. The societal values also to be taken into consideration. Let us try to know the gravity. Then only we become serious about this uh, OXO Act. So when you take this uh, Ministry of Women and Child uh, Development, you know, uh, 2007 study, there were 52. Point, uh, uh, three percent children reported having faced one of the more forms of sexual act, and of course here the females are more involved, uh, affected than the males. So maybe it, uh, it was around ten to fifteen percent difference was there. And National Crime Bureau uh, record shows that one or nine children in India have been sexually abused per day in India. So see the enormity, and ninety five percent of the offenders were known to the child. That is the problem. That's the problem here, and. Uh, one more thing is that in a position of trust and responsibility, again, the law has taken, folks has taken this point into consideration and they framed the punishment. And of course, common states are, again, I don't want to mention them. Of course, it is there in each and every state. So that means to say that, that when I'm talking about this gravity, it is only a tip of the iceberg. Next slide, sir. Next. So why this doesn't come into... A, uh, previous one. Why this doesn't come into picture? Because the child is unable to express because they are threatened and they are uh, uh, sometimes, you know, they think that uh, revealing <laughs> harm to the family, family patients and, and, you know, sometimes uh, they are, uh, uh, the victims may threat, threat to the child, that child may not be able to 
open it. On the way, sometimes you know the children may not think that it is important to, or it is so uh, important to report also. So the offenders can be anything. These are the spectrum of offenders. You know, they can be relatives, it can be a child, also elderly child, or it can be uh, any institutions. Recently in Karnataka, you have seen so many uh, religious institutions much uh, being held responsible, and uh, they are languishing in jail because this spoke so. Hard. So. Uh, even in, in even in hostels or institutions also the caretakers may be the perpetrators so offenders can be anything and any, anybody next slide next one uh, no, actually, you know, uh, why these children, why they are targeted? Because they are vulnerable. And among the vulnerable children, again, we will have to have all these uh, points into consideration. It can be because of poverty or physically or mentally handicapped children. They are more prone for it. And socially isolated families because they are prone for atrocities and they are not taken care by the society. And parents of mental illness, if the parents are suffering from mental illness and broken homes, the parents themselves are alcoholics or drug addicts, then also the children are vulnerable. And single parent children, I have already told the children who are in foster care and adopted children also, they are vulnerable for this sexual abuse. So next slide. So uh, before POXO, I told you that uh, there, there is so many acts like, you know, IPC act was there. So what is the problem with those IPC sections? Well, they did not protect the uh, children uh, and they did not differentiate between the male and uh, female children. And there was no distinction uh, while, while examining the children of the sexual offenses. And uh, they, they, they are not giving much of a consideration to the children's uh, emotions and support was also not given, not supported properly. So therefore, considering all these facts, uh, loopholes which are there earlier before COXO, this law, special law came into existence in, as I said, in 2012, which contains nine chapters and there are 46 sections. Again, there was an amendment which took place in 2019 because the punishment was enhanced. Child pornography was to be included as well as penetrative sexual acts. They enhanced the punishment for this. Next slide. So this was the scenario before Foxo, and later on, uh, yeah, next. Next slide, yeah. So these are the key features of uh, Foxo Act. So children should be less than 18 years. And then the previous slide, please. Previous slide. So these are the key features, you know, like, you know, emergency medical care is also included. And there was a provision for made for false reporting also. If any false report is there, that is why any pediatrician who is supposed to report these POXO cases need not be afraid. Even if it is proved false, the one does not, doesn't lie on them. So another thing is mandatory reporting and recording, which is very, very, uh, I mean, uh, important. And then uh, anybody, not only pediatricians, I'm talking about here, any anybody who comes, in, uh, comes to know about these uh, sexual offenses has to report to the authorities. I'll tell you the third is later. And here there is a care and uh, protection is also being included. There are special courts which are uh, formed for this purpose only, first track courts. And compensation, important point is compensation and the rehabilitation of the child is also being incorporated in this uh, folk song. That is why it has become a very good uh, comprehensive uh, act which protects the child sexual abuses. Next. And then, uh, the, what are the uh, 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 offenses covered under the Act? There are about six, you know. They have actually covered all these things. And even the, uh, what you call, uh, the abettors. Abettors are also being included here. And these are the penetrative sexual assault, aggravated penetrative sexual assault, sexual assault, sex, the sections also, relevant sections are being mentioned here. The aggravated sexual, sexual harassment of the child, even the child for pornography purposes. So, what happens is aggravation means, one should remember here, aggravation means that if the person who is committing or offender is in a position 
of authority if he is misusing his position or trust then it becomes aggravated and the punishment is also severe it can vary from not less than life imprisonment and one more thing is if the child is mentally retarded so making use of that innocence and uh, exploiting that again comes under aggravation so these two points we should remember and if we come across such uh, uh, incidences the punishment is also very severe these are the uh, under various sections uh, for this uh, different uh, different offend uh, assaults these are the punishments and you know uh, this is of course this is not only with the minimum punishment and maximum punishment is mentioned here and of course it is always associated with fine so next slide and uh, uh when do we come to know hepatitis will come to know during the routine checkup when you are doing in clinic and practice or even hospitals when you are doing routine checkup will come to know if you have slightest suspicion immediately you should report and uh, suppose sometimes you know parents can themselves can bring and, uh, and strangely some children children then they, they themselves can present to the pediatrician and you will come to know that this has been sexually molested or abused and then it has reported and uh, many times police will bring the case child court also orders and cwc child welfare committee is they play a major role that part an important part and parcel of this uh, so and, and jj but juniors justice board people also can bring anybody even the associations you know ngos they can also bring so uh, yeah uh, this question i think i'll answer um, later on and uh, this these are the things which are important as far as the pediatrics is concerned physical health issues like you know the other issues serious issues also physical injury of genitalia and related complications std hiv aids and pregnancy and childbirth the other day we had uh, uh, under our karnataka uh, iap this uh, medical legal chapter we had a talk on uh, this uh, pregnancy teenage pregnancies and childbirth and the abortions and the laws which are gone by those uh, surrounding the abortions that was a wonderful talk where because we need to know that itself is a big chapter so aware you know uh, this uh, uh, laws in abortions there are methods we made uh, these methods can be used for even the uh, uh, females are even for this teenage pregnancy that means for the adolescent uh, mothers also so So what methods? If you know, as a pediatrician, if you know, we can refer them properly to that uh, particular centers or the general college where safely these MTPs or abortions can be taken place. And if any child is having pain or itching in the gen genital area, difficulty while walking or sitting, the gait is altered. You have to be very vigilant when they come to the clinic. Pain during defecation or maturation, frequent UTI, genital infections, and uh, recurrent pain of demands. These are all the points which have to keep into consideration and suspect this child sexual abuse so maybe you'll have to report next so mental health issues also part and parcel of uh, very important part and parcel of this uh, sexual abuse so these children immediately they may go for a stress shock fear confusion self blame social withdrawal somatization so we should keep our antenna high to look into this uh, points and uh, Uh, if you don't recognize this uh, uh, immediate causes, they themselves might become perpetrators. Long-term complications like PTSD, depression, anxiety disorders, eating behaviors, sexual dysfunctions, alcohol and drug abuse, they can go for and suicidal behavior. We should be uh, aware of these mental health issues when the child is subjected to child uh, sexual abuse. Next slide. and uh, again a, a pediatrician has to don a role of so many things here you know like uh, he, he has to play a clinician role he has to play, play a forensic role and he should act as a counselor already the counseling has been discussed widely by dr vijayarani and then the advocacy advocacy is also very very important assisting the court as an expert so we are will be called as an expert here so when you are collecting the material Uh, the evidences that has to be produced there, and of course determination of age that uh, been already discussed in our basic born age, and the age is also we we'll have to determine the. You can employ the role of others also in determining the age of the child. Next slide. So, as a clinician, 
water is supposed to uh, play. So emergency care, of course, it's very mandatory. It is incorporated in the law. So we'll have to take care of that emergency and uh, give the treatment. And ongoing medical history of the child experience. So history is very important. Conducting heads, you can apply here. You can take a medical history very patiently. And we will have to build up a rapport. And we will have to meticulously take the history. And uh, detailed medical exam, which is very, very important. And treatment of medical conditions and prophylaxis against STD and pregnancy. So one word about this uh, treatment of medical conditions is that this takes precedence over the reporting. This takes precedence over the court proceedings. So emergency and an emergency can always depend that you are going to treat the patient or whatever which I mentioned, all these uh, physical health issues that you have to treat and then you can report it. So mental health assessment and treatment is also part and parcel of you have to play as a clinician role. Either we can take care of counseling or we can refer to the appropriate authorities. What is the forensic role we are playing here as a pediatrician? Collecting evidence. Back, back, please. Next slide. Ah, yeah. Collecting evidence. We have a kit. A safe kit is also available and the rape kit is also available. This kit contains so many uh, uh, items and that we'll have to have. And it's really easy. To, you can approach the authorities and you can collect those uh, kit and then collect the evidences if it is available. And then the developmental assessment, age according to sexual maturity rating, had to be done. Forensic interviewing is also one of the important aspects. Assisting court in recording the child statement as witness and in investigation. So here it will have to be very child friendly, and that is being there in the law also. At each and every stage of this investigation procedure, it should be child friendly. Child should be given a break, and then child should be taken into confidence. We will have to build a rapport, and then the things will start falling one by one. And of course, advocacy role, it is more of a prevention. It's a sort of creating awareness, not only among the child and the adolescent, among the parents also, and those who are taking care of the child, sex education and training of all stakeholders. Stakeholders in the sense, those who are all involved. It's a combined team effort. Next slide. So emergency medical care, again, you know, uh, these are the various uh, points which being uh, mentioned here. So <clears throat> I'll not go into the detail of all these things, you know. Uh, one of the things, emergency medical care already uh, told, but it has to be provided within 24 hours. So that is the time limit. It's been there in the law. And no legal or managerial magisterial requisition. So here, you know, there no, no compulsion on the pediatrician. Please go back to the next the previous slide. So no compulsion. And nobody can force you as a pediatrician. You'll have to take care of the child, treat the child, and then, then report. So of course, there is a time limit. So whom are we reporting? If you're reporting, you know, need not go to the this uh, special police units. Uh, juvenile police units are there being provided for this purpose. We also have child line 1098. And we can also, there is state commission, child commission, state child commission, national child commission. Juvenile courts are so there, so we can report them directly. This is one thing being provided in this law. And uh, when the victim is a girl, then a lady doctor or woman doctor is being uh, compulsory. So a woman doctor has to be examined. But earlier, you know, this this point was not there in the uh, before the POCSO Act. But again, this is being a, a provision, a good provision, a benefit. But it can also sometimes, you know, if the no no lady doctor is not available, uh, no uh, doctor is available, then it becomes problem. So then somebody, a lady assistance can be taken who is not related, but child's confidence should be there with that lady, and then in front of that it can be examined. So next slide. And one more thing is that. There was a taboo earlier, you know, only government uh, centers have to be examined. No, not now. Now it is not there. Anywhere it can be done. Even if the private hospitals has to do. And suppose if the attender is not there, it is the duty of the hospital authorities to provide a, attendant, a confident att attendant to examine the child. That is the, the, the presence of a proper person here. And before examination, you will have to review all the documents, information, talk to the parents, victim, police, and inform investigation officer. Take the consent of the patient. Like, consent and the assent has been already discussed. It is less than 18 years. Here, you are taking the assent. 
If it is more than 18 years, it becomes sad. And again, in Pokesar, where I went to Vadodara, where for a workshop, there was the discussion that the ascent is from 12 years to 18 years. And if the child is less than 12 years, so then the parents or whoever has brought the child or whoever the child is interested in taking care, their consent can be taken. So upon that, collection of samples is very, very important. Once you collect in an appropriate kit and appropriate methods, then it should be labeled and then the chain of evidence should be maintained. So it is a chain. It is not only a single collection, it is a chain. And uh, uh, this uh, kit I already told, ICMR rape victim examination kit is available and that can be utilized. Next slide. Uh, uh, medical examination, as far as the medical examination is concerned, we are going to treat cuts, bruises. You may ask pediatrician what, what to be treated. So these are things and the STD is also to be treated. In case of if you suspect HIV, again, the prophylactic, prophylactic treatment, management of possible pregnancy. So the emergency contraceptive should be discussed with the pubertal child. That you'll have to take the pubertal child into confidence. Pubertal child, one more thing, pubertal child, suppose if anybody wants to interfere with the examination, any procedure to be done, the child can refuse. If it is above 12 and below 18, child can refuse. Therefore, the counseling and the explaining and then taking the child into confidence and building a rapport is very, very important. And of course, you are going to correct the mental health issues also. So wherever necessary, a referral or a consultation for mental psychological health is very necessary and the counseling can be done. Next slide. So, uh, timing of examination. So, if this immediate bleeding is there, if the child is in shock, or if, there, if you find any injuries, we'll have to immediately interfere. And this is the point, you know, collection of evidence becomes important because, you know, live sperms are, can be there within 20 to 20, 15 hours of the rape victim, within 48 to 78 hours, dead sperms, and later examination injury, STD, pregnancy, mental health issues. That is what we are going to concentrate if it is more than that period. Next slide. So reporting and reporting already told, I've already mentioned whom to report. So who has to report? It is only pediatrician who has to report or it is the doctor who has come across who has to report or anybody for that matter who has come. So here it doesn't differentiate. Not only pediatrician, anybody who comes to know about this, suspects this, they will have to report. And whom to report? Not only this uh, juvenile police units, uh, special juvenile police units are in the police stations. If they are not there, even one helpline can be child helpline, commissions, which I mentioned already. And enter report. So reporting is mandatory because if you don't report and you are liable for punishment. Immediate within 24 hours are late. Consequences of what is what we mentioned. Consequences are not reporting. If you are in doubt, so child is lying, and uh, your uh, authentication is not there, so you are suspecting something uh, false, then also you should report. So you should not hesitate to report. That is what is being mentioned here and important also. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> so reporting is mandatory. Not reporting is an uh, punishment, is an offense. Previous slide previous one, jumping a thing. So, uh, you want the previous? Yeah. So punishment for a person, the jumping. This is reporting. Yeah. If parents are refusing, suppose parents might refuse, parents are accompanied and they come, you examine, you suspect, then you'll have to report a or inform the CWC. You can take the help of CWC and J Juvenile Justice Board also. So judiciary help also you can avail. And then in such cases. So why parents refuse? Because reporting is very easy. We can easily, with a phone call or a message or a, this thing we can report. But the procedure is very lengthy. They are afraid of that procedure. It's a lengthy procedure. But anyway, if you build the confidence and if you tell the consequences and the uh, uh, the, the other, other issues related to child sexual abuse, the long mental health issues and all those things, then definitely they would agree. Next slide. Moral support is also being 
uh, uh, necessary in such cases. Next one. So they have studied around, uh, this is a study comprising of 2,384 children. So, you know, see, that is the problem with this uh, Fox Act, you know. Overall, 96% of the children had normal examination. That means to say that it is not that they are not undergone child sexual abuse. It is the late reporting. Uh, they would have come late. So, where the, uh, already mentioned, uh, so what are the mental health issues or some physical uh, examination, you find some points. So, 4%, they had STD, acute genital trauma, or healed hymenal trauma, transsexual, so this is the area. So, the child statement plays a major role in admitting the case. The child, you'll have to take the confidence of the child and then slowly you'll have to examine and then counsel the child, then they'll come out. Otherwise, they will not come out. So, that is the important thing. And uh, in summary, what I would like to uh, tell about this is that the trust of a child about his complaints is very, very important. So, not only trust should come from the child side, and you'll have to have the trust in the child statement also. And one more thing, always, you know, as a pediatrician, we should not insist for FIR. So you, 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 you can't keep on asking for the see, police has not come, and nobody has reported, and no legal authorities are available, and therefore I'm not going to examine. No, that is not there. So you should not insist on FIR. And even for the medical, once again, I'm emphasizing here that you are going to treat, you are suspecting, no doubt, there is a sexual offense against the child. But treatment takes the upper hand. So nobody can force you. Even police people, they cannot ask you, they cannot question you why you are treated, why you interfered with, before we, our arrival. So all these things, you do not care. You can go ahead with the medical examination, treat them, emergency care. And especially if it is life-threatening, then you'll have to interfere, take the treatment, take the upper hand, and then you can report. As per the legal position later on. And main goal should be medical examination. And treatment is the collecting evidence also. So evidence also, onus lies on the collecting evidence. So whatever is possible, that can be nails, it can be hair, it can be footprints. And uh, this, uh, what you call, if you are suspecting rape, then the semina. Uh, so all these things can also be semen. So all this can be collected, properly collected in a proper container, which is there in the kit, and then it has to be preserved, sent. In majority, medical examination yields very minimal findings that we already discussed, you know, that study is there. So reporting is mandatory. If anybody is not reporting, they are liable for punishment up to six months of imprisonment, including a fine, and provide free treatment. Here, you are providing free treatment, avoid secondary victimization. What secondary victimization you are going to? In the sense, you know, if you don't take them to confidence, the family who are reporting, they will be abused. They are socially victimized. And, uh, you know, the, the perpetrators, offenders can escape and they can take advantage. So, not only that, the pediatrician has the role of assisting the other stakeholders, which I mentioned, in CWC, police, as well as uh, the other, uh, those who report, the parents, uh, the child. So I think uh, for this, next slide. So this is a short presentation. Of course, you can talk uh, any number of times on any length of time about this POXO Act. So there are so many things which I, in fact, we can discuss, but uh, I think I conveyed the, what are the gist or the crux of the problem effectively. Thank you very much for your patient listening. And I'm once again, I thank you all of you for calling me and allowing me to give it to Thank you very much. It was a comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much for taking me a little time. And I uh, apologize to the delegates for uh, uh, exceeding the time limits. And um, I would like to thank all the uh, faculties, uh, those who have uh, contributed immensely. And it is uh, definitely useful sessions for the pediatricians and I thank them all wonderfully on behalf of IAPT Energy and Adolescent Health Academy. I request Dr. Pradeep Kumar to talk. Um, Pradeep, you can talk. Good evening, dear sir. So I take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt gratitude for the exceptional CME organized under the leadership of Dr. Aram Chindal, sir. His dedication and commitment to providing quality healthcare education and promoting adolescent health is truly commendable. CME was enlightening and informative 
bringing together professionals from different fields to share their knowledge. This history taking session by Dr. Mona Baskar, ma'am, it was really eye opening. The adolescent counseling session by Dr. Vijay Rani, ma'am. Obesity management session by Dr. Akhila, ma'am. And the POKSA ad was really eye opening by Dr. Nityananda, sir. So the presentations were so informative and engaging, and the discussions also were so thought thought provoking. No doubt, the CME is a grand success. And I would like to uh, extend an invitation to the South Zone Pedicon, which is being organized in Kanyakumari, Sangamam Pedicon 2.0 in August. I am inviting all of these speakers to be part of our adolescent workshop, which we have planned there. And it is indeed an honor to be part of this event. I look forward to working with all of you stalwarts in the near future. Thank you so much, sir, for offering me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. You are initiative uh, for this program. And, uh, and I immensely thank one and all. We'll wind up the sessions. Anyone who wishes to talk can. Dr. Vijay Rani, your, your, your final comments. Unmute. Thank you so much. I know it has been arranged in a short period. And uh, I must thank uh, really Dr. Nityananda because it's a tough topic to talk. Very, very difficult to get it across voluminous. But you've done a very nice presentation. So thank you so much. And mm -hmm. uh, we should keep the tempo on adolescent health programs, do more programs in future. And also in chat box, Dr. Emuna has given some valuable uh, comments like, uh, uh, because we are still at to uh, do more, uh, learn more things about child sexual abuse. We, we will like to hear more uh, CMEs on this. Uh, aspect also. Thank you very much. Neeta uh, Patil, madam, you are there. Sir, I think the whole session was very interesting. I got one question for Nityanand. I think Nityanand knows. Yeah. Now there is a yeah. burning problem, sexting and sexual cyber harassment. It is a gray area, whether it comes under POXO, because that is very much increased COVID and post-COVID. And when POXO was done in 2012, Social media was not very active, but is it a time to widen the scope of the POXO? We don't know, but uh, Dr. Nityanand, you can tell in short, because as already we have overshoot the time, what is your opinion? Uh, actually, madam, you know, uh, though the law came into force in uh, 2012, there was an amendment which took place as far as the child pornography was concerned. And uh, anybody who's using explicit uh, this uh, child uh, pornographic material as far as the child is concerned and any suggestions that is definitely finishable it comes it is covered under POXO Act whereas 16 to the minor with the pictures but anyway messages I don't know that has to be recorded properly recorded and the complaint has to be lodged so again as you said it is a gray area it has to be though 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 the clear picture is not there as far as only message is concerned. Suppose if any pornographic material, pornographic purposes is being used, it is proved, then it is beyond doubt, comes under Volkswagen and is definitely punishable. Thank you. We, can call, can, call it as, a, we can call it as a digital yeah. sexual harassment. Yes, Devraj Rauchu, sir, is there. I think he can Perhaps. comment more. Yeah. And Dr. Devraj Rauchu here, um, this sexting and other... Uh, Information Technology Crimes come under Information Technology Act. So there is definite uh, uh, recognition for that and there is punishment also for that. The only thing is that you will have to have proper uh, evidences. Mm -hmm. You have to have proper evidences. Okay, thank you, Dr. Devraj. And Dr. Mona, your, uh, your final comments. I just want to thank everybody for the talk. Thank you. Dr. Suresh Balan, the president of IAP Tamil Nadu State Chapter. Suresh, are you there? Okay, we'll wind up the sessions then. Dr. Suresh, you are not there? Okay, we'll wind up. Thank you. Wonder doll. Good night and one up. Special thanks to Dr. Chanti and the Tamil Nadu Pediatric Association as well as Baha. I mean, uh, Tamil Nadu AJ. <laughs> Dr. Sainthil has done great job. I think in a short period, he has arranged beautifully. All the experts uh, have conveyed us a clear message.
i think we are looking forward for some more activities like this from tamil nadu thank you ma'am yeah, this was a very beautiful uh, program and very educative also and uh, i want it to continue like this after covid we i think we have forgotten about webinars so apart from uh, regular uh, conferences these do contribute to people and their education thank you please continue yeah this will be available on the iap tnsc youtube channel also thank you one and all and good night thank you good night